Now we go to recessible contracts. And if you will notice class, precision in the civil code is discussed twice. We did not discuss it before because I intend to discuss it together with this provision. Although that will be later on. You have the rescission under 1381 and the rescission under 1191. Okay? But before we go to the distinction between the rescission under 1381 and that of 1191, again, you might be asked in the bar exam to enumerate what are those rescissible contracts. Now, if you will notice, again, I highlighted certain letters. G for guardian, A for absentee, C for creditors, D for defendant, and L for law. So, my code, which hopefully can help you remember what are the receivable contracts, is C GLAD. C for creditors, G for guardian, L for law, A for absentee, and D for defendant. C GLAD. Okay, anyway, you don't need to copy this because this is what appears in your code. I would just like to suggest what will be your code so that you can easily remember it. So I highlighted the letter G in guardian, letter C, creditor, L for law, C GLAD. A for absentee, and D for defendant. Okay? Now, this is what I would like you to remember. Because you might be asked in the bar exam, distinguish recession under 1380 with recession under 1191. If you will recall, 1191 talks about reciprocal obligations. Wherein we mentioned before, how can the parties in a reciprocal obligation be considered in delay? The performance of one of the parties of his obligation will automatically give rise to the delay of the other party. Okay? Now, remedy in a reciprocal obligation is rescission. And here, under 1380, one of the defective contracts is what we call as a recessible contract. So what is the distinction between the two? Number one, when it comes to the person who can file the action for rescission, under 1191, it is only limited to the injured party. And definitely, this injured party is the one who has already performed his obligation. Well, the other one, in spite of the fact that he already performed his obligation, a reciprocal obligation, the other one does not like to perform his obligation. Unlike in 1380, the party who can file the action for rescission is not only limited to the parties in the contract, but even a third person. Okay? The next distinction Rescission under 1191 is based on non-fulfillment of the obligation. Always non-fulfillment of the obligation. Because remember, 1191 has something to do with reciprocal obligations. So, yung lang party na hindi, yung nag-perform ng obligation, siya lang ang pupwedeng mag-file ng action for rescission. At the same time, the basis is what? non-fulfillment of the obligation by the other party. Whereas, in 1380, the grounds are lesion, referring to the damages suffered, or fraud of creditors. So, 1380, there are more grounds, unlike in 1191. And finally, in 1380, there is no period for compliance. While in 1191, there is a period for compliance because, as I've said, in 1191, there's already a delay because of failure of the other party to perform his obligation when one of the parties already performed his obligation. Because again, let me repeat, 1191 is always a reciprocal obligation. 
1380 need not be a reciprocal obligation. It may be a unilateral obligation. Okay? So, kindly remember the distinction between 1191 and 1380. Is there a prescriptive period for filing an action for rescission? I'm referring now to rescissible contracts. Okay? Under the civil code, as a general rule, it is four years from the celebration of the contract. Why do I say it is a general rule? Because there are two exceptions. If the ground is based on the guardianship and the other one is when it comes to absentee. So in the case of guardianship, four years will be counted not from the celebration of the contract but from the termination of the incapacity. When it comes to the absentee, four years will be counted from the time that the domicile of the absentee is known. Class, be very careful about the reckoning period. When do you have to start counting? Because although you memorize, you have memorized the prescriptive period, the examiner, okay, with the intention to mislead you, might, what, give a date in the problem. And if you do not know when do you have to start counting the period, you might think that the action is not prescribed. Okay? So be very careful, especially if there is a date indicated in the problem. So again, does the action to file for the rescission of the contract, does it prescribe? Yes. And what is the prescriptive period? General rule is four years from the celebration of the contract. Except if the grounds have something to do with the guardianship and that of absentees. Okay, next. What happens if the contract is rescinded? Number one effect, the thing must be returned with the fruits and the price with the interest. Because if you will recall class, one of the effects of an obligation is the delivery of the accessories and the accession. As a matter of fact, if you will recall how we distinguish accessory and accessions. So the accessory and accessions there refer to the fruits, to the interest. So if the contract is rescinded, you have to return the fruits that you have received, the interest that you have received. Okay? If the return is not possible, what is the alternative option to be done? Pay damages. Indemnity for damages. That means the indemnity for damages that is in lieu of the fruits and the interest which cannot anymore be returned. And if there are several alienations, the first acquirer shall be liable first. So these are the effects if the contract is rescinded. Okay? Distinction between avoid and voidable contracts. Class, this is the general distinction between avoid and voidable contracts. Because if there is a special law governing the contract, the special law that governs the contract will prevail. So if you will notice, this one cannot be applicable to the contract of marriage. Why? Take note, in void contracts, it may be invoked by any person, even if he is not a party to the contract. But in a contract of marriage, in accordance with the administrative matter issued by the Supreme Court in March of 2003, which I hope you have a copy of that, rules for filing a petition for nullity of marriage, only the contracting parties can file a petition for nullity. So this one refers to void contracts other than a contract of marriage. Okay? When it comes to voidable contracts, only the parties. Which, again, if you will compare it with the family code as well as with the new rules for filing an action for the annulment of marriage, general rule, only the aggrieved party. Exceptions 
who can file an action for annulment of marriage. If the ground is insanity, the relatives of the insane spouse. And if the ground is lack of parental consent, the parent who did not give the consent can file a petition for annulment of marriage. So, this one refers to contracts in general except contract of marriage. Okay? Next point of comparison, whether it can be confirmed. But now, sometimes a commentator uses the word not confirmed but ratified. So, confirmation, ratification, they are now the same. So, in a void contract, it cannot be confirmed. It cannot be ratified. A void contract, the action does not prescribe. Action for the declaration of nullity of a void contract does not prescribe. So, this kind of comparison is also applicable this time to a contract of marriage. If the marriage is null and void, the action does not prescribe. So, kahit na yung nanay at tatay mo nag-celebrate na ng diamond anniversary, pwede pa rin silang mag-file ng petition for nullity of marriage because it does not prescribe. While a voidable contract it is a contract that can be ratified. The action prescribes. Class, this is applicable also to a contract of marriage. Isn't it? In a contract of marriage, there is ratification by cohabitation. And if the period for the annulment of marriage, which is what? How many years? Remember, in the family code, the magic number is 555 sardines. Bakit? Five years prescriptive period for the annulment of marriage. Five years prescriptive period for action for legal separation. Five years for what? Compulsory action for compulsory recognition if it is filed by the relatives of the minor child. Okay? Five years for impugning the legitimation of a child by subsequent marriage. So basically, the prescriptive period in marriage is five years. What about for contracts in general? If it is voidable, what is the prescriptive period? Prescriptive period is four years. Okay? Now, another point of comparison. The reason why it is a void contract, it is due to violation of public policy while in avoidable contracts because of the presence of a vice of consent. And when you say vices of consent, you're referring to threat, intimidation, undue influence, fraud. And finally, when you are talking of avoid contracts, it is void ab initio from the very beginning. Even if there is a signing, even if it complied with the formality that it should be in a public instrument, okay? That will not make the contract valid because it is void from the very beginning. Similar to that of a void marriage, even if there is an exchange of I do's, even if the marriage was consummated, it will not negate the fact that the marriage is void ab initio. And what do you mean if it is void ab initio? From the very start, there was no contract kahit na nagkapirmahan in front of the notary public. While in the case of avoidable contract, it is valid until annulled. Okay? And that is the reason why in a contract of marriage, children born before the annulment are considered legitimate. Valid until annulled. Now, for the grounds of annulment, of contracts in general, if you will notice, it is only limited to ATV. Why ATV? V for vitiated consent and I incapacity. IV or ATV. And here, take note, what is the reckoning period of the four-year prescriptive period? If you're talking of the vices of consent, 
Four years from the cessation of duress. Four years from the discovery of fraud. Four years from the removal of incapacity. Not four years from the perfection of the contract. So be very careful, class. You should know when do you have to start counting the four-year prescriptive period for the annulment of contracts in general. So again, let me repeat. Four years from the cessation of the duress, wala na yung takot, wala na yung threat. Doon ka lang mag start ng counting ng four years within which to file your action for annulment of the contract. And I'm talking to a contract in general, not contract of marriage because the prescriptive period for the annulment of marriage is five years. Which, again, in your family code, the reckoning point will be dependent upon the kind of ground invoked. Diba? Now, four years from the discovery of fraud. Four years from the removal of the incapacity. Now, if earlier we discussed what are the effects if the action for rescission is granted, this time, we have the effects of annulment of contract. You have to make a distinction. Why? Whether the contract was already performed or whether the contract was not yet performed. So if the contract was not yet performed, the parties are just released from their obligations. Just remember, we're talking here of an obligation arising from a contract. So when you say contract not yet performed, it means that the obligation has not yet been performed. So that means parties are just simply released from their obligations if the contract is not yet performed. But if the contract was already performed, mutual restitution. Ano ibig sabihin ng mutual restitution? Ibabalik mo lang. So kagaya nun, kung na-deliver na yung bagay kasama yung fruits, Babalik mo yung property kasama yung fruits. Kung natanggap mo yung bayad, ibabalik mo lang yung bayad. Parang kung halimbawa, nagpaanal ka ng contract of sale of a laptop. So, ano ibabalik mo? Mutual restitution? Balikan. Balik mo yung laptop, makukuha mo yung ibinayad mo. Mutual restitution. Now, if it involves prestation to do, rendering or performing the service, then the value of the service shall be the basis for damages. Kasi syempre, kung na-perform mo na, pwede mo bang bawiin yung nagawa mo na? Halimbawa, napinturahan mo na, pwede mo bang tanggalin yung pintura baklasin mo? <laughs> Hindi. Restitution there will be in the form of damages. Okay. What will be the effect? Because we said a while ago that avoidable contract is subject to ratification or confirmation. Effect of ratification. Ratification retroacts to the time that the contract was entered into. And it purges the contract from any defect. What do you mean by purge? Kung baga tinanggal kung ano yung mga defect. And we said the defect has something to do with what? The vitiated consent or the incapacity to give the consent. So, pag ni-ratify na, parang baliwala na, nalinis na. And, as I've said, just like in a contract of avoidable marriage, di ba? What is one ground for avoidable marriage? Tinakot po ako, ayokong pakasalan yung asawa ko, e na in love ka na. And you decided to, what? Continue, cohabiting with your spouse. So that is tantamount to ratification. And whatever defect was existing at the time of the celebration, it is already deemed purged. Nawala na. Nabura na. Okay? Now we go to another defective contract. The unenforceable contracts. And in an unenforceable contract, the contract is valid. Okay? But it is only unenforceable. What do you mean when the contract is unenforceable? If there is failure to comply with the obligation arising from that contract, you cannot go to court and demand for specific performance. Why? 
because it is unenforceable. So what is the remedy? The remedy, if there is failure to comply with the statute of fraud, is to compel the other party to reduce it into writing, to comply with the statute of fraud. Okay? So hanggat hindi mo napapareduce into writing, you cannot go to court and demand for specific performance. Now take note, the classes of unenforceable contracts based on 1403, contracts that are covered under the statute of fraud, which I would like you to memorize. Contracts that are entered into in excess of authority. When will this be applicable? Contract of agency. Kung sumobra yung ginagampanan ng iyong agent, okay? The contract entered into by your agent is unenforceable. Okay? Contracts entered into were in both. Take note, it should be both, not one. Both parties are incapacitated. So when you talk of incapacity here, you have to what? Connect it with Articles 37, 38 of the Civil Code. What limits or restricts one's capacity to act? And usually, in a contract, in general, the incapacity has something to do with age. Diba? So these are the classes of unenforceable contracts. And as I mentioned, the remedy is to compel that it should be reduced in to writing, not to file an action for specific performance. And then finally, you have the void contracts. If you will remember class under Article 4 of the Family Code, the absence of the essential or formal requisites will make the contract of marriage void. That, in a way, can be your guide if you will be confronted with contracts in general. Ganun din, the absence of an essential element will make the contract void. Last meeting, isn't it, we discussed what are the elements of a contract based on perfection, if it is a consensual contract, a solemn contract, and a real contract. So the absence of any of those elements will make the contract void. And in addition to that, yun those contracts that are against public morals, public policy, good customs, etc. Pareho rin yun, di ba, sa contract of marriage? Ano yung contract of marriage that is void? Not because of absence of any of the essential or formal requisites, but they are void because they are prohibited marriages. Incestuous marriages. They have the elements, but they are prohibited. So here, that is the summary of the four defective contracts. If you will be asked to make a distinction. The void, the voidable, resistible, and unenforceable contract. So if you will notice, when it comes to cause or the ground for a void contract, as a general rule, the absence of any of the essential elements or formal elements in the case of marriage. In the case of voidable, you have the vice of consent. In the case of resistible, you have lesion, damage, suffered. Okay? In the case of an enforceable contract, you have what? Lack of formality, failure to comply with the statute of fraud, lack of authority, if the action was done in excess of authority, lack of capacity of the parties. Now, whether the action prescribes or not, in the case of void contracts, the action will never prescribe. Yun na nga lang, ang pwedeng ibanat nyo, kung halimbawa may itanong, although the action does not prescribe, that's where the possible defenses of what? Laches, estopel, may be applicable even if the action does not prescribe. Diba? Of course, you have to study the entire problem given. Kung gusto nyong sabihin na the action or the, uh, the complainant's case should fail, not because it prescribed, 
but because of estopel or latches. Okay? What about in case of voidable? It prescribes. So, in the contract of marriage, after five years, if you did not file the action for annulment, the marriage is ratified. In contracts in general, after four years, if you, you did not file the action for annulment of the contract, the contract is considered valid. Okay? In rescission, we said, it is also, what? There is a prescriptive period of four years. So, it also prescribes. In an enforceable contract, will you apply prescription? Hindi. Bakit? Although it is valid, it is unenforceable. And being unenforceable, you have no right going to court. Unless it is reduced into writing, that's a time that you can go to court. That's why it does not prescribe, not cure by prescription. Okay? As to whether it can be ratified or not, avoid contract, it cannot be ratified. Because from the very beginning, it is not existing. While avoidable contract, it can be ratified. Resistible contract, it need not be ratified because the contract is valid. Diba? Nagkataon lang may lesion, may damage. Kaya ka nag-file ng action for rescission. Kaya nga ang effect ng rescission, ano, you have to qualify whether the contract has already been performed or not. Because the contract is valid. That's why ratification is out of the question. In unenforceable, that is where ratification can apply. Especially if we're talking here of the act performed by an agent who did not have the authority or who exceeded in the performance of his authority. So, his action can be ratified. Okay? So, since a void contract has never existed, therefore, it cannot be valid and binding. In the case of voidable, it is, since it is valid unless annulled, therefore, it is valid, binding, until annulled. In the case of resistible contract, since we said it is valid, it is binding unless rescinded. And unenforceable, they are very consistent. It is a valid contract, although it is unenforceable. Therefore, it is binding. Is that clear?